You're listening to Mountain Heartbeat with Joan Rosa Hopkins, proclaiming the gospel through word and through song. Hello, and welcome to Mountain Heartbeat with Joe and Rosa Hopkins. Thank you for joining us this Saturday morning. Today on our program, we have a very special guest. She's uh, had a television show and has a very large family. I think you would all recognize her. Um, Her name is Michelle Duggar, and I thank you and welcome you to our program today. Well, thank you, Rosa. It's a joy to get to be with you. Absolutely. And I forgot to mention that she's authored several books and uh, basically that she's a staple on uh, TV all around the country. And so the reason why is because you have such a large family, 19 children, which, first of all, that's amazing. And my first question would be, how did that come about? Was was that your original plan to have a large family? And if not, how did that happen? And what what is your personal testimony? Well, actually, when Jim Bob and I met, we didn't plan to have a large family. But in the course of um, our life, God changed our heart about children and how we viewed children. And I feel like when we first got married, we talked about, well, you know, we might have one, two, maybe three kids, but we didn't want to have children at first. And so we went on the birth control pill. I was on the pill for about three and a half years, and then we decided we were, you know, wanting to start a family, and so I went off the pill, and we ended up getting pregnant, had our first child, and then I went back on the pill, and we, what we didn't realize is that the pill can actually cause you to have a miscarriage or an abortion. And it was written in the fine print, but we didn't know that. And so that's what happened. We, um, you know, I was on the pill, and, and then I ended up getting pregnant. And I lost that baby. We, we were grieved. I mean, we were, here we were, just, you know, enjoying being parents, holding this one baby in our arms and then realizing that with our own lack of knowledge, our own, our, literally our own hands, we'd allowed our baby to be destroyed. And as believers and as Christians that really, we felt like we loved life and valued life, we were devastated. And we, we just began to search the scriptures and we cried out to God as we read in the Bible that God says children are a blessing and a gift and a reward from Him. And here we were trying to, you know, not receive gifts, not want any of those blessings. We were like, devastating. We said, God, forgive us and give us a love for children like you love children. And right at that point in our life, we just said, Lord, we give this area of our life to you. If you want to give us more children, more blessings, then, Father, we want to receive whatever gifts you want to give us. And right after that, God blessed us with twins. And we had uh, Jan and John David and then Jill and Jessa and Ginger and Joseph <laughs> and Josiah. And, and then we you know, had Joy and then another set of twins, Jedediah and Jeremiah and Jason and James and Justin and Jackson, Johanna, Jennifer, Gordon, and Josie. And believe me, we would have never dreamed that God would have given us 19 children, but we are so grateful. We couldn't imagine life without one of them, and uh, we and, you know, are just thankful to God for each one. Yeah, no, that is absolutely beautiful, and I'm sure that was devastating to have a mis- miscarriage and to lose a baby like that. I'm, I'm sure that was absolutely devastating. And so that was actually a direct result of having been on the pill, because that's something that I personally have never heard. And I'm sure that a lot of our listeners haven't either. Would you mind um, maybe elaborating on that a little bit? Yes. Well, you know, there is a really great book out by Randy Alcorn entitled, Does the Pill Cause Abortion? And I, I'm, I know it sounds like a very hard to, you know, title to a book, but oh my, how eye-opening just to to know the information um, that, you know, a lot of Christians just don't know. They just don't know. We didn't know, and I think there's so many things that God says in His Word, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I feel like just, um, you know, not knowing information really um, can 
can be very damaging to us. And so I would recommend, you know, people check out that book by Randy Alcorn and really get the facts on the birth control pill and, you know, consider, you know, how do we view this and what what do we, you know, receive from, you know, the Lord and understanding about that because I feel like we just didn't know. And so, but yet, you know what, God is, it is so merciful. I feel like, you know, the baby that we grieve over and we've lost and then later on down the road, you know, we were expecting Jubilee, um, which would have been number 21, really, for us. Mm-hmm. But at that point, you know, Josie is number 19 living children, but um, little Jubilee would have been our number 20th living, and we miscarried her at about, you know, 20 weeks in the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And um, we have her picture on our baby wall in our home, and uh, we talk about little Jubilee um in our family, and we thank God for the time that He did let us enjoy carrying her in my tummy and feeling her kick and and all of those mm-hmm. things. But I think, um, you know, life is precious, and uh, God is the giver of life, and He's also the one who can choose when that life. He says our days are numbered, and. Uh, so we want to redeem the time for the days are evil. We know that every day is precious, and we want to enjoy um, every moment that we have here with our children um, and just point them to the one who is the giver of life. Yeah, absolutely. And so you were talking about society's views and things like that, because having a large family and loving children and seeing them as a blessing is really countercultural. Um, how do you think that, society's views on children have affected our culture overall and why do you think most people are against having large families these days well i think there's a number of reasons i think in our society we view children sometimes not always but sometimes as a burden um you know they're they're expensive i mean if you waited till you could afford them you'd never have them you know (laughs) and so you deal with expense you deal with the fear of you know, am I going to be able to, to raise a child in today's day and time and and all of the things that we face? You know, there, there's a lot of different reasons, but I think overall, if we just go with what our society says, you know, we we would fall into some of those traps of, of thinking, well, I can't afford them, they're too much, and just, I want to finish all these goals that I've got, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but I know in our heart and in our life, we just really kind of had swallowed the whole idea that, you know, when I'm ready, in my timing, and, you know, I'm going to do this the way I think I want to do this, and, and, and then, you know, for us to go through the sorrow that we went through, um, I think it just woke us up to the realization, wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, Lord, we love you, and we say that you're the Lord of our life, and that we've given you that lordship, you know, like, so to speak, mm-hmm. given the steering wheel of our life, and yet here we are taking control of this area and saying, no, we don't want gifts from you, we don't want any children, and, and so in our heart, in our life before the Lord, we just know that that was where God brought us to. And that may not be where God brings everyone else about that, but for us personally, we just know that the Lord really um, opened our eyes, broke our hearts over where we were, and um, and then miraculously gave us, you know, the family that He did. And it definitely is um, a God thing. I don't think that that's just something that God... <laughs> I mean, 19 children is just a, a phenomenon to me, and I'm the mom. I'm the one that birthed them, and I still am in awe that God would would give us 19 children. And, and like I said, we're thankful for each one of them, and really, each one of them are thankful to be here. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And so you mentioned finances and things like that, too. Um, how has God provided for you as your family expanded over time? Well, I think early on, um, you know, we learned some Bible principles about finances that were life changing. And so, probably one of our favorite number one things to share with people is. J. 
Jim Salmon's Financial Freedom is a Bible study seminar that we have recommended from the time we went through it years ago. And so we don't make anything off of that. It's not um, anything that we would, you know, recommend that we would get any, feed, you know, any kickback from. But just because it knit our hearts together, Jim Mom and I, you know, we um, we learned Bible principles. For instance, you know, get out of debt and stay out of debt. Owe no man anything but love. And that was a new mindset to us. And so we purposed together as a couple early on to do that. It took us seven years to get out of debt. But when we finally did, we said, Lord, we purpose not to go back into debt. Um, We want to stay debt free. Um, And then, you know, there's a lot of other things that we learned through that Bible study, um, you know, uh, purposing not to go into partnerships. It can damage friendships, and there's always, a, you know, there's just so many things that we learned. And we were in a partnership in business. Okay. And so I think we learned, I think we learned from our mistakes probably more than we learned from just getting it right, you know, from the get-go. And I think it just burned into our memory how important just knowing the truth because God's truth will set us tr- us free but sometimes we just don't know the truth and if we just study it out and find out about it and I say you know early on in these young people's lives if they just catch these Bible truths they can avoid a lot of pitfalls in life just learning God's mm-hmm. truth because God has something to say about all of these things and so that financial freedom Bible study just was life-changing for us. Absolutely. And before the recording started, Michelle and I were discussing how when my husband and I were in debt back in 2011, God led us actually through Michelle Duggar's website to the same program, Jim Salmon's Financial Freedom Seminar. You can even get them on Amazon. That's where we bought it. It was secondhand. So we, we saved some money on that. And we I, I, I will tell everybody that will listen that basically when we were in debt, my husband had to work six days a week at his job because we couldn't afford the electric bill otherwise. We couldn't afford the regular bills. He had to work six days a week. And that getting out of debt basically, and with his job, he's been there many years, so he has uh, access to a lot of time off if he wants it, that basically it enabled him to save up enough time so that when I gave birth to my child, in 2015, he was able to take a full six weeks off with me and to take a lot of time off that first year, even in addition to that. And that would never have happened had we stayed in in debt and a lot of other things that it has freed up our family to just be able to fully follow his will, whereas being in debt means you have a set budget every month and so much you have to pay to these debtors. So I also recommend that. No, I don't make anything from it either as I bought it from Amazon. <laughs> so, but um, I, I fully um, endorse what, what Michelle is saying here because we've lived it out ourselves. And so since um, you're ha- you have a, a, your day-to-day and it's been on television. Most of us have seen it from time to time on your on your various programs. What would you say are some of your biggest life lessons that you've learned just in having and managing a large family? Well, I'm looking at it from um, raising, you know, babies to middle kiddos. I call them my middles. I got littles, middles, and then I have adult children, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the grandbaby now, which is such a joy. And um, and I look at I look at life, and I just think, wow, Lord, you know, your word has the answers for all of life's questions. Like the Bible really is the owner's manual for life, and in it are contained, you know, answers to parenting, to uh, child. development and um, finances, you name it, everything. And I think one of the things that I think in my littles, raising littles and toddlers and babies, is I think just, you know, beginning at a very young age to, to just spend time reading the Bible to them, singing to them, loving on them, holding them in your lap and nurturing, because that's what moms do. We nurture, 
you know, we set the tone and the mood for the home and to find joy in that because a joyful mommy makes a joyful home. And when Jesus is in the heart, that's where real joy comes from. You know, I've heard it said happiness comes from happenings around us, but deep, real joy comes from knowing Jesus. And so when mama is spending time in the Word and in prayer, talking to the Lord, talking to Jesus on a daily, minute-by-minute basis, then our children are going to see that lived out in front of them. They see us rejoice. They see us cry. They see us struggle with, you know, just the pressures of life and, you know, pulling things together when you've got little toddlers at your feet. And I think choosing joy, it's a choice. I don't think that... um, you know, you can walk around with a smile on your face every minute of every day. But there are times when I would look at my little ones in the face with tears streaming down my cheeks because maybe I was having a hard moment that day, and and yet I could scoop them up in my arms and love on them and say, you know what, Mommy loves you so much. Through the tears, with a smile, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I think I wrote that in one of my blogs one time or on my website, at DuggerFamily.com, where I talked about the laundry room experience. Because I think moms, we experience all of these emotions as we're walking through life with our kids. And I literally felt like, oh, Lord, surely you picked the wrong person for this job. I'm not a qualified person to be a mommy. I mean, like, when you bring that baby home from the hospital, I, I remember thinking, really? Like, I get to take this baby home, and, and all by myself, we're going to learn how to mm-hmm. you know, take care of this baby and raise this baby. I'm like, sure. I'm like, we should be professionals yep. to be able to do this, you know? And we start out, like, not knowing anything, and we, we're like, but God is so faithful. He gives us, you know, godly mentors, role models that we can look to in his word and in real life. If you didn't get it from your own mama, you know, God places these tightest two women around us. And I just think, I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful that that I can find what I need from the Lord and from other godly women and, and then just live that out with my kids. And I think just choose joy and then enjoy the time that you have with them because you will blink. And your family, your kids will grow up. And before you know it, they'll be um, going from diapers to driver's ed to having their own family and their own children. And I'm just like, I'm there. I mean, I'm experiencing all facets. I've still got six that I have in the homeschool room, two that are apprenticing and learning, you know, mechanic skills and building trades. But I am still there. I'm there in a lot of different facets now. I've got my grandkids here today with me. I'm getting to babysit. I love that. And I've also got my kids in the homeschooling room doing their their homeschool and their music practice today. And so mm-hmm. I just know it is a joy. And yet there's those hard moments when you think, oh, wow, I wish I could just figure this out immediately. But God, I'm depending on you to show me the wisdom and the truth that I need to speak into this one's life today. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I felt the same terror when I brought my child in. <laughs> and I remember okay. thinking, I don't know anything about babies. I was the youngest child. And, I, you know, my siblings didn't have children. And I, I was the youngest. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing. This is so frightening. And uh, yeah, so I totally relate. And I think a lot of people relate to that, too. Um, what would you say to people that have been considering forsaking birth control or letting God be in charge of of their family planning? Well, I, you know, I feel like for each couple, that is something that they have to go before God about. And I wouldn't say what, what we know to be right for us in our life would be exactly what everybody else must adhere to, because I feel like God leads and guides through His Holy Spirit and in His Word, and um, and I feel like for us, God just met us at a, a very um, real moment in our life where we were just broken and revealed to us the path that He wanted for us. And I can say that each one of these children are a blessing and a gift from God, and 
I know I couldn't I couldn't imagine, like I said, life without one of them. And and I know they're grateful to be here. And I would say, you know what? Enjoy the gifts that God gives you because they are a gift. And whether that's one or two or adoption, the families and the friends that we know that couldn't have biological children have adopted children and and I see our dear friends the McPhersons who have adopted a number of kiddos and just are an amazing family. I keep telling Shauna, you gotta write a book. You got to write a book about what God has taught you and shown you with this journey of adoption and these precious gifts that God has blessed you and Mike with because it's just there's different has that God takes different ones on. But I think when you realize that you value each life is a gift from God, and however God gives those gifts, you know, to your family, and however many that is, just enjoy them, love them, point them to Christ, graze them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and just see what God will do. I mean, it just, it, it, it's their gift. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I really appreciate what you're saying about basically you have to walk by the spirit because the, the way in which Christianity can be lived out is myriad and what God will have one person do isn't necessarily what he has another one because, you know, we have the, the body and that's what it says in the Bible. You know, the hand isn't the same as the eye or the ear or where would the hearing be? And um, so many different things, you know, even like mundane things like clothing, what to wear. I remember hearing early on when I became a Christian that this is the way you ought to dress. And so I, I did. And then I felt God leading me into something else as he led us to become gospel performers and people who made music videos and did performances that we were actually, to, well, I was, to dress more flamboyant than what I was hearing that it was supposed to be very, very um, almost, um, I can't think of the word, very nondescript. And that God, I felt in my heart, that's not my plan for you. And I thought, but that's what Christians are supposed to do. But so, yeah, we all have our path and we all have a reason why God has us do what we're having to do. So I love that. And so um, in your life, there are many things that are different than what our culture does. And even than other Christians, for example, no television, um, frugality, as you had mentioned, um, basically responsible financial stewardship. And so there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of misunderstanding. And I'm sure you're really used to that. But for those of us that, that see you taking that and we're trying to live out our own uh, Christian walk. And so for me, per, I'll say it for myself personally, I am scared to death of criticism. I don't know why, but it just is. And so when I see somebody like you and I think, how do they stay strong in their convictions and what God has them to do? And he's obviously blessing it. How do you stand strong though, when people criticize and nitpick and pick apart everything you're doing and even ascribe false motives to it and, and still maintain um, your strength of conviction about how you, God has called you to live your life? Well, I know that God is, He sees everything. He sees our heart. He doesn't look on the outward. He sees the heart. And so knowing that, I think, you know, I can have peace in my heart before the Lord about what God has shown me and what He's doing in my life. And he will he will reckon all of that, you know, in 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 the future and in the end. But at, at this point in it, I know whenever there's a critic that voices their opinion or what they think about whatever it is they see in me or my life or whatever, I feel like you know what God can use even a critic to teach me whatever I need to learn through his word. So I take that through the grid of God's word, any criticism, I say, okay, Lord, is there truth in this that, that you want me to learn that needs to be changed through your word? If there is, I want to have a learning spirit. I want to humble myself before you and, and receive whatever it is that I need to hear here. And then I know that often 
with critics, um, they can actually become some of our best helpers in our Christian walk with the Lord because it it can um, almost uh, maybe uh, clarify our message. Because I think, um, for example, let me just share this with you. I, I feel like I'll be just real transparent on a, a good example of this. When we were writing one of our books, we would send it back at the at the end as we were getting closer to finishing it up, and it would be in a hard copy form. And so then we would get that back with any corrections or or ideas of things that might need to be a little bit better clarified. So in one situation, in one of our books that we were writing, we got back part of our um, our manuscript, and it had read, you know scribbles on the sides and and all for us to, to go back and work on some areas. But it was interesting to me um, that this this person who had done it was really coming from a very critical angle. And I was kind of surprised at first. It kind of like, it, it almost kind of irritated me. And I thought, oh, well, how could they have that attitude, you know, in this? And they're saying it from a very critical standpoint, and here we're just about to finish this book, and I'm like, why? I'm like, Lord, who is this person in the red, you know, writing with the red letters, you know, on this ink? And and as I began to go back through all of the little, you know, marks and notes, and well, why did you say it like this? And what do you mean by that? And, and I could tell in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my, this is really somebody that, you know, probably doesn't agree with this statement or what we're saying here, and then I just remember going, Lord, okay, what is this that I need to hear? What are you wanting to to show me through this? And as I went through every one of those notes and lines and scratches and marking out of things or circling paragraphs or whatever, I really took to heart what they were asking because I thought, you know what, Lord, there's many people that probably don't understand this or maybe don't agree with that, and how they're hearing it and how they're receiving it, God, I want it to be seasoned with salt from you. I want it to be, because you say we're the salt of the earth. We are the, the, the candle, that light that's set on a hill, you know, and Father, I don't want to be, I mean, sometimes salt can be very painful when you put it on a wound, but it heals, you know, it's a healing substance as well. And so I'm like, Lord, I know that sometimes this is not going to come across the way that people want to hear it, and maybe not, but God, I do want it to be cleansed through your word. I want it to be right, and it's your testimony in my life. So, you know, somebody can say, no, that's not whatever, but Jesus, you did this in my heart. You changed my life. And I am a new creature. I'm a new person. And I know what you've done. You you have walked me out of darkness into light. And you've changed my life. And I can't, you know, they may be able to disagree with whatever they want to disagree with, but go back to your word, Lord, and show me what it is. And I tell you what, it clarified our message that we were just trying to share what Jesus has done. And I, I know God says they overcame him. Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives even unto the death. And I think, you know what? Jesus is in my life. He's in the lives of other believers. When we have Christ in us, and we share what Jesus has done in our life, God says he will use that testimony to set others free, whether it be financial freedom or, or moral freedom or just peace of mind that only, you know, I mean, the peace of God that passes understanding that others, I remember when I, I was born again at the age of 15, I went back to my, my high school the next day, and I just sat in my classroom, and I thought, I looked around at all of my friends, and I thought, my friends, my friends, they just don't know that they could be forgiven for everything that they've done wrong and have this peace and this joy that I have in my heart. And I just know that's what I wanted to share with them. I wanted to share with them that they could know Christ and know that they had eternal life. And and I think as a believer, um, 
you know, clarifying our message through the critics, but then also being able to let the, the curse that's causeless shall not come and let those other things just roll off of our back. And we can't do that in our own flesh and strength, but Jesus can shield us. He is our refuge and our rock and our shield. And so those others that are out there just trying to be mean or, or, or just they believe firmly what they believe, but you know what? I think we'll all come to the end and we'll reckon with God because he says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I know that one day we're all going to stand before God and have to give an account. And before my Lord, I go back to Jesus. There's nothing good in me, nothing good but Jesus Christ. And if there's any good that anybody sees, it's Jesus and everything else is me because that's the only good in us Mm -hmm. is Christ. And so I pray that, you know, through this life, I teach my children, you know, um, there are reasons that we have, you know, these bumps in the road or we have, um, you know, those that are going to come out against us. But don't react. Go to God and go to his word and then receive whatever God wants you to receive and let God just do away with those other things that don't um, need to, to be heard and move forward in your walk with Christ in humility and the fear of the Lord, and you'll be okay. Absolutely. I love that, especially the don't react. I, <laughs> I, that if there were, um, you know, more people that followed that piece of advice alone, I think we'd have a lot uh, fewer fights online and what have you. So yeah, I really appreciate that. And it, it kind of ties into that, but um, your family was thrust into the limelight and you became famous and was how was what was that like was any part of navigating fame difficult were there any surprising aspects to that well i think that when god laid on our hearts years ago jim Bob, and i uh were praying and he was actually just reading his bible and just felt like god had just kind of said to him you need to get involved in the political realm here and we were both shocked because we really hadn't really been involved in any political aspects of things, but um, God called us into politics years ago to make a difference for life. I think we were at a rally one time at our our state capitol on the lawn asking our representatives and senators to ban partial birth abortion, and they voted it down, and we were shocked. We, we couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. And so Jim Hub said right at that point, he just felt like God said, you need to get involved. And so we did, and Jim Hub served for two terms in the Arkansas House of Representatives, um, and we were so grateful we got to serve with Mike Huckabee, was the governor at that time, and there were prayer meetings every morning before they started session with Governor Huckabee, and, um, and I think, you know, at that point, we, um, we had what we considered a large family, and uh, we had nine children, and then we ran for office again, and we're expecting um, twins, and we went from nine to 11, and and um, and then we ran for U.S. Senate, and we didn't win that race, but as a result of, of that, um, the media picked up on this family with a lot of kids, and they ran for office, but they didn't win, and then um, somebody else picked that up, with um, with uh, Discovery, and so Discovery picked that up, that storyline, and they connected with us and said, hey, could we do a, a one-hour documentary about your large family? We're just really curious, and we think our, our people that watch, you know, our, our, our broadcast would be interested in your family. So we prayed about that, and we sought counsel because we thought, you know, we don't want them to make a freak show out of our family. You know, that could be very easily done, you know. And yet we went back to them and we told them, we said, you know, we would be okay with you filming our family if you do not edit out our faith. Because our faith is the core of our lives. And if you don't show that, you wouldn't be telling the whole story. And so they came back to us and they said, it's your story, you can tell it. And so 
they filmed that first one-hour documentary with our family, and they they it took them about a year to film it, and I ended up I was pregnant and expecting, so they t- entitled that first documentary 14 children and pregnant again and our son Jackson was born on that show and uh, Jackson is now 13 years old and so I think um, you know they documented um, just the daily life activities of raising you know a large family and I think just the curiosity of how logistically do you do that and and um, and how do you you know, provide for them and what in the world, you know. And I think it just, it, it was, I think, you know, our heart was to just share that children are a blessing and a gift. And we said, you know, Lord, if our allowing um, them to film our family could keep one woman from going through with an abortion, Father, it would be worth it all. And we've had a number of people send us emails saying, and for instance, one woman, she sent an email. She said, you know, I was scheduled to have an abortion. I'd already gone in for my preliminary appointment, and it was scheduled for the next day. And I was sitting in my living room flipping through channels one evening, and I came across 17 kids and counting. And she said, as I watched that, she thought, you know, man, If that lady can do it with 17, surely I could do it with one. And she said, I canceled my appointment. I kept my baby. And she sent us a picture of this beautiful little toddler. And she said, this is the joy of my life now. I can't imagine that I was, you know, I can't imagine life without this one. And and I just think, you know what? It is about life. And if you don't have life, um, you don't have anything. And so... Um, yeah, we're in awe. I don't think it really isn't about our family. It really is about making Christ known, giving hope, uh, because I think there's hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope in God and in his word. And the truth is uh, what sets us free. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I love all of that, that those are eternal things when people keep their babies those are things that matter so yes absolutely that is so beautiful and so um and it kind of ties in with that what you're saying the purposes of your uh life being filmed and exposed to the public for is uh, do you have a life verse or a leading principle that you actually live your life by i do i sure do and i think um, years ago, when I was standing in that laundry room, um, I probably, oh my, I wish I could remember right now off the top of my head, but I know I was expecting, and I probably had like seven little ones under the age of maybe 10, and I'm standing in the laundry room late one night, folding laundry, um, and just trying to get everything done so that we could start our next day with clean undies for the ones that were potty training and, you know, clean, <laughs> clean clothes, you know, to put on for the next morning. And, um, and I just remember with tears streaming down my cheeks, I, I was talking to my Lord and I said, Father, oh Lord, I feel so overwhelmed, you know, surely you picked the wrong person for this job. You know, I, I feel like I'm so inadequate. I want to nurture and love on each one of these precious little faces, you know, and kiss them and hug them. But I, I just feel like I, I I can't do it all, you know, the the the, the meals and the the shopping and the, the the music lessons and school lessons and um laundry, dishes, diapers and all the details of life and, and yet God I I need you. I need you to show up right now. You know, I'm like, Lord, if you don't rescue me, I feel like this whole shit's going down. God, help me, you know? Mm-hmm. And in a so small voice, I mean, it wasn't audible. I didn't feel the Lord. It wasn't like I, but I just know he spoke to me. And he reminded me, number one, of, of the words that an older woman that had shared with me earlier years before, Michelle, let the joy of the Lord be your strength. 
And that came back to me at that moment. And this little song that I always would sing, um, hearing it with my, you know, in our Sunday school class or with my, my own little ones. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That little song came to my mind, and then the scripture from God's word to offer up a sacrifice of praise to the Lord, because God's word says he inhabits the praise of his people. And just in simple obedience, at probably 1 a.m. in the morning, I was worshiping my Lord through tears. I sang that to him. I quoted that verse out loud to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he heard my cry. He heard my prayer. And so I went to sleep with peace in my heart, knowing God had heard my prayer. But I woke up the next morning and absolutely nothing changed in my life. I still had just as many dirty dishes, just as many dirty diapers, all of the details of life to fulfill the next day. And I went through that day, you know, just knowing God heard my prayer. And shortly thereafter, I was sitting in music lessons with our sweet uh, Ruth Anita Anderson, who is our piano teacher, who's taught all of our kids piano all these years. Um, And she noticed that I kept nodding off to sleep. And uh, she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just a little tired. I stayed up late last night finishing the laundry. And she looked at me and she said, laundry, do you need help with your laundry? I'd be happy to help you with that. I love to do laundry. And I was so shocked to hear that. And I thought, somebody loves to do laundry, you know. Yeah. And so I said, well, I, maybe I do need help with my laundry. I, I don't know. And so... She said, well, I'll come over and help you. So on Saturday, I went and picked up Nana, who we call her, lovingly call her Nana now. Um, she's our adopted Nana. Um, but anyway, we went to church with Nana for years, and she was a widow that we went to church with. And so I brought her over to her house, um, and she went into that laundry room and and said, don't worry about a thing. Just show me where things at. And I'll, I'll call you if I need you. I'll holler for you if I need you. But don't worry about a thing. Just close the door and go on. And so I did. And I remember later that afternoon, she opens the door, and here is nice, clean, folded stacks of laundry, and it smells so good in the laundry room. And I literally cried. And I said, Miss Anderson, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much. And for 13 years, faithfully, Nana came to my house, and help me with laundry. And over and over and over again, I told her, Nana, Nana, you're an answer to prayer. You're like an angel sent from the Lord. I mean, you literally have taken loads and loads and loads of laundry off my shoulders so that I can focus on a lot of other things, you know, loving my kiddos and and doing fun projects with them for, you know, school and science projects and all these things because I just know God heard my cry. I didn't even know what I needed, but God knew what I needed, you know? And I just think, I say to others out there, we all have crisis of faith or moments where we just feel like, I'm overwhelmed. I I really don't know what to do, but Lord, I'm trusting you. You've got the answers, and I'm looking to you for that answer, and he will answer us. And he will be there to meet that need, whatever it is. And so the, my life verse at that point became, uh, from here on out, it really is Second Corinthians twelve nine, And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Because I was weak at that moment. I was so, mm-hmm. so weak. And so I say back to him, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that's my life verse, because he is real and he is my strength. 
And in those moments when I feel so weak and, and you know, unable, he is all sufficient. His grace is sufficient for me. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'd like somebody to come over and do my laundry. So if Nana, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if she's not busy. Well, she, still, she still comes over and does piano oh, on wow. Mondays with our dear room. And, um, and so she is so precious. We love her so much. And so you can pray. God knows what you need even better than you know. Absolutely. Sometimes I think I don't even know what I need, but the Lord is so faithful and so kind. Absolutely. And you can also see, too, where God brought people together. He brought you into this close relationship with Nana that you probably would not have been that close to to have, um, you know, if, if it, you had not gone through the laundry crisis. And so I just I love how he ties that in there, too. And so um, I would ask you, is there uh, what opportunities are you currently lending your time to are there any projects in the works any any new writing or, or anything that uh, that you're working on right now well you know we've got all kinds of exciting things going on and i i share at mops groups i feel like that's something god's really placed in my heart to speak into the lives of mommies with young children i think back when i was at that place you know with lots of little ones i think god just really place that Titus to mom mentoring kind of thing in my my heart for mamas. And so I share and, and will speak at mops groups and mommies groups. Um, I think, you know, our family is, is growing. It's always exciting because we have children getting married, kids that are having, you know, their families are growing, we're getting more grandchildren, and, and so there's just and always something going on in our lives with our kids and our grandkids. And, and I just think it, life is a joy. I mean, it really is. Life is a classroom. I tell my kids, we never stop learning. We never stop growing. And so I, I think just, you know, there's, um, we're going to be speaking at some family conferences and other places coming up. We just got a lot of things going on. It's just, it's just, you know, life is an adventure with the Lord, and and there's so many things that we can, um, you know, just experience and grow and learn with our kids and our grandkids now. That I think um, there's a lot of neat things happening. So, yeah, yeah we, I don't know that I've got a book in the writing, but I'm definitely chronically. I was like yesterday, we were laughing so hard. I'm writing notes in my phone all the time, and I'm journaling a lot for my Bible times. My quiet times with the Lord, but I watch my little ones and my grandkids do the funniest things. So I've got these lists of out of the mouth of babes is what I call it. Some of the funniest things that kids will say and do, and they're just so, just so real about it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, so I was shooting this out to all of my kids in a text. My adult kids say. Look at this. I've got all these things. I'm like, add to them anything that you remember that I didn't catch. Because I'm just like rolling in the floor laughing with the kids about these things. And so who knows? There may be, you know, out of the mouth of babes, there may be a book that comes from this. Because I'm like, kids will say the funniest things. Yeah, actually. And I'm like, we've got a storehouse of them here. I I completely, uh, I would second that opinion yesterday. I have, uh, sometimes I will buy jewelry that's on super clearance and I bought a bag of jewelry that was actually broken because I thought, Oh my, the, the beads are gorgeous. Maybe I'll, I'll fix them up. And I haven't gotten around to doing that. So my baby, she pulled the bag of, of all this broken jewelry and she holds it in her hands and she says, very pretty. And I thought, Oh my God, that's so funny because those are busted, broken, basically not really useful beads and I was thinking it's a matter of perspective and I felt like God said do you see what just happened I'm like yes I saw what just happened there and I took a picture (laughs) of her with the broken jewelry that it's a matter of your perspective that broken things wink wink in other words if you're feeling busted and broken bruised like a lot of us are like I am and I just felt like God used that to minister to me because it was so wise and so I I love (laughs) I love that. And I'm sure you get a lot of moments like that now with the grandbabies. I'm sure that happens all the time. 
So definitely oh, keep, yes. keep notes. You should definitely keep track of all those different events and take pictures and who knows, because yeah, I, I love that idea. Um, <laughs> and so where can our fans, oh, excuse me, we'll have, Joe, we'll have to edit this when you're listening to the playback. Let me start that one again. So where can your fans find you and find your materials online? Well, we have our official Duggar family website. We've also, or, or Facebook, I, I will edit that, Joe. <laughs> we have our official, we have our official Duggar family Facebook. And then we also have our website, DuggarFamily.com. And there is a blog. Um, that's run by uh, Lily and Ellie. That is our official Duggar family blog. And so there's a lot of different places there. There's three places that you could check out, um, you know, resources that we love to share with others that have really encouraged us in our life. And um, and so, yeah. And then, of course, you can watch on, on TLC, um, The Counting On, with our girls and uh, pick up on all the things that that our kids and our grandkids are doing um just a lot of fun things going on mm-hmm. absolutely well i thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today on mountain heartbeat well rosa thank you so much it's been a joy to get to visit with you and get to know you absolutely thank you